Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Strife is bickering, arguing, heated disagreement and an angry undercurrent. The angry undercurrent is the dangerous part because that's what we have when people are pretending like everything's okay, but behind the scenes or deep down in their heart, there's bitterness and resentment. And when opportunity comes, there's gossip and criticism. And strife destroys. Satan uses that evil spirit to destroy marriages, to destroy all kinds of interpersonal relationships, I believe that strife is the culprit that destroys many businesses because I don't think that we can prosper where there's no peace. Many churches are destroyed by strife. We can't have anointed services when the songs that we sing are pretty, but there's strife in the worship team. One person's jealous of another. I should be leading worship and not you. I sing better than you. You didn't treat me right. I should have done a special. You never let me do a special. There's no anointing for people to receive the Word of God. When they go and park themselves in a seat, but they're judgmental or critical of the pastor, the way he does the service, the length of the service, it's amazing the things that people can find to murmur and complain about. And we need to realize how totally, completely blessed we are to be able to freely drive into a place like this and hear the word all weekend. We need to keep the strife out of our lives. Now, if there was a newspaper that was an expose on strife that came out, let's say, once a month, it might read something like this. Headline, couple attending Bible college loses everything they have in a fire. Warned by God, but tried to rebuke the warning. Christian businessman confused over having to file bankruptcy. When questioned about strife among his employees, he said it was not his responsibility to deal with the issue. Teenage believer turns to drugs, says he can't see God in his parents, all he sees is strife. Church dies due to strife among the leaders. Couple never receive the inheritance promised to them in the Word of God because they ignored the chastisement that they received from God about strife in their marriage. <laughs> Growing Christian school destroyed. Holy Spirit reports that there was strife among the teaching staff. Now you see, I've been part of a church that was destroyed by strife. I've not only been on this end of church, I've been on that end of church. And I know a lot of the nonsense that can go on in places if people are not taught properly the dangers of strife. This is not just a little teaching, it is dangerous. And you need to treat strife like poison. I have a reverential fear of strife. So many times things happen in people's lives and nobody can understand it because after all, they're in church every week and they're such nice people and they're ushers and they're greeters. But then when you find out the truth, there was all kinds of junk going on at home behind closed doors that nobody was dealing with. It doesn't matter how many times a week we go to church, a house full of sacrifices with strife is not pleasing to the Lord. Amen? There's power in agreement. There's weakness in disagreement. Now, getting along with people is not easy. And it's not something that's going to happen accidentally. It's something that is only going to happen if we do it on purpose. And the only way that we're going to make this decision to do it on purpose is if we realize what we're giving up. If we don't make a commitment to have peace in our life and in our relationships. You cannot have an argument if one person or two people are not in pride. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Let him exalt you in his own way, in his own time. You'll be amazed how many arguments that will save you 
if you will get a more humble attitude of mind and instead of always assuming that you're right and everybody else is wrong, get it ingrained in your thinking that you're not right about everything. Our opinion is not the only one that's right about everything. We don't have to get our own way all the time. Matthew 18, 19, let's see what it says about the power of agreement. How many of you want to pray and get your prayers answered? Well, the Bible teaches us that one of the ways that we can get just about anything we want is if we find somebody that we're in agreement with, not just once in a while when we need a miracle, but living in agreement with. Again, I tell you, if any two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything and everything they may ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Do you realize what an amazing scripture that is? I wrote outside my notes, wow. That's a wow scripture. If any two, if God can find two people that will make the effort, make the commitment to get along, to keep the strife out of their mind, out of their heart, out of their conversation, out of their lives, and they pray, he can do great things because one puts a thousand to flight and two ten thousand. If you multiply that up to four, that becomes one million. What would happen if you get four people living in agreement? Well, see, I was taught a long time ago about the prayer of agreement, but it kind of came across to me like if you need a miracle, you get somebody to agree with you for that miracle. Well, really, that's just nonsense because that's not what the Scripture says. You can't gossip about your pastor all week. Then when you get a bad report from the doctor, go to him and ask him to agree with you for a miracle. Come on now, I'm preaching better than you're acting. But if you make the effort all the time to stay in agreement with him, and when you hear somebody gossiping about him or saying something unkind, you turn around and cover that with something good. You make an effort to stay in agreement with people in your family. You go the extra mile. You honor the God-ordained principles of agreement, keeping the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the offense, and the strife out of your life. We have to keep it out of our life. Then, boy, when we need a miracle, and we start praying with those people that we're in agreement with, there's no place for the enemy to get in. The Bible says don't even let the sun go down on your anger. If you're mad at somebody, get it straightened out before you go to bed. It says don't give the devil that kind of a foothold. And you know what happens when he gets a foothold? Then he can get a stronghold. Well, how many times do you go to bed mad? At the person you're sleeping with in the bed. <laughs> I know I did it lots of times in my life. Do all kinds of silly stuff. Sleep on the seam of the mattress rather than ask Dave for any of the cover. <laughs> Freeze all night and be miserable while he's just snoring and having sweet dreams. <laughs> Come on now. Anybody here ever go to bed mad? Oh my gosh, that's way too many people. <laughs> well, then God's got you in the right place tonight. We need to start taking what the Word of God says seriously. And if God says don't do it, then we need to make a commitment not to do it, just because God says not to do it. <laughs> Amen? It's dangerous to go to bed mad. We open a door for the enemy when we go to bed mad. I would swallow my pride if I were you and go to the person and say, look, I don't want us to fight. I'm sorry. Forgive me. We need to have peace. Humble yourself. Be a maker and a maintainer of peace. Or you can be stubborn and say, well, I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> well, okay, then lose another night's sleep. Do it long enough. Get an ulcer. Have headaches. Be miserable, keep opening the door for the enemy, and then wondering why things aren't working in your life, even though you go to church every Sunday and have a few CDs. <laughs> Amen. 
So we have to make an effort to live in agreement because there's power in agreement. You need to have an anointing in your home. You need to have an anointing that your children can sense. You need to have an anointing for your finances. You need to have an anointing for wisdom and creative ideas. God can't do anything where there's no peace. Let's look at, look at Luke chapter 10 for a minute. When I saw many, many, many years ago what I'm getting ready to share with you, it was a real revelation to me and it's meant a lot to me over these years. Luke 10 verse 1, now after this the Lord chose and appointed 70 others and he sent them out ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to come and visit. So get a vision, Jesus sends out 70 of his disciples, men that he'd been teaching, and he told them to go into the towns and begin to minister. He said, the harvest is abundant and ripe, but the farm hands, the laborers are few. Pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no provision bag, no change of sandals. Refrain from retarding your journey by saluting and wishing anyone well along the way. Now he wasn't saying go out and don't be friendly. He was saying stay focused. Whatever house you enter, now watch this. Whatever house you enter, first say peace be to this household. Freedom from all the distresses that result from sin be with this family. And if anyone worthy of peace and blessedness is there, the peace and blessedness you wish shall come upon him. But if not, it'll come back to you. Stay on in this same house, eating and drinking what they provide. And do not keep moving from place to place. But then he goes on down and he says, but if you go into a town and they reject you and they don't like you and they don't want you around, then shake the dust off your feet and go on because you're not going to be able to do anything there. So it's interesting to me that when he sent these guys out, he said, first of all, you got to have a base of operation. you got to have a place to sleep. you got to have a place to eat so you come back at night and rest. And make sure that you find a peaceful place as your foundation to work from. Because if you don't dwell in the midst of peace, it's going to disturb the work that I sent you out to do. Now what I got from that is I have a call on my life and God's given me something to do. And I want it to be powerful. When I stand up here and speak to you, I need for my words to be drenched with the anointing of God. I tell people all the time, I don't do anything fancy. I just talk. And to expect people to cram into a building and listen to me talk for six or seven or eight hours in a three-day period of time, there has to be something there that's going to captivate their attention and make them not only want to come back, but go out and buy more of it on CD and DVD and books and take it home with them. And it's not because I'm an eloquent speaker or have a melodious voice. It's because of God's anointing. And after preaching the word for 35 years, I have discovered some things that I can do to increase the anointing, and I have discovered some things that I can do that will shut God's anointing down fast. And I could stand up here and be a phony and say all the same things, but it would not penetrate into your heart the way it does if God's all over it. Just think about what will happen in your lives if you make an effort to maintain peace in your home. And then you need a miracle from God and you pray. Compared to fighting and arguing and bickering and living one way behind closed doors at home then going to church on Sunday, praise the Lord, glory to God, thank you Jesus, hallelujah, go back home, fight all week, next week, glory to God, thank you Jesus, praise the Lord. And I know that this happens, not with everybody, of course, but many people just don't understand the importance of this. We perish for a lack of knowledge. And every once in a while, I think we just need to have a little bit of the fear of God put into us. And I'm certainly not trying to, to scare you, 
But I want to warn you that if you don't keep the strife out of your life, you're making a big mistake because you're opening a door for the enemy. Now in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, some very favorite scriptures of mine that I have used a great deal in my teaching tell us that we need to have peace in three different relationships. We'll start in verse 10. Let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from guile. Well, this even connects to peace because there's nothing that starts trouble any more than a mouth that's not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Every argument that gets started gets started because somebody said something that stirred up somebody else. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it. Let him do right. And I love this. I love it, love it. Let him search for peace. He didn't say just pray for it, hope for it, want it. He said you got to search for it. You got to pursue it. Let him search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, moral conflicts, and let him seek it eagerly. Seek it. It's a very strong word. Seek it. Go after it with all your heart and all your might. You see, after years and years of turmoil and frustration and fretting and worry and anger and bitterness and resentment, and being offended and getting my feelings hurt and being touchy and going to church. <laughs> I finally thought, I am going to have peace. If it is the last thing that I do while I'm on this earth, I am going to find out how to live in peace. And I don't care what I have to change. I don't care what I have to give up. I don't care what God has to do to me. I am not going to live upset anymore. And I tend to think that unless you get just that aggressive about it, that you may never have it. Unless you just happen to be one of those people that were born peaceful, and there are a few. <laughs> You're just real easy going, laid back. I mean, you know, that's just the way you are, but there's, there's only a few of you. <laughs> and even if you are like that, you're probably married to somebody like me. Somebody with a personality that's a lot more aggressive and strong and on and on. Now, but it says here, don't merely desire peaceful relationships with God, with yourself, and with your fellow man, but pursue and go after them. So this is so important because I think that there's a pattern here. You got to have number one, peace with God. Number two, you got to have peace with yourself. And number three, then you can move on to peace with people. But I think one of the biggest problems that we have is we're trying to get along with people when we don't even like ourselves. Did you ever think about the fact that you have a relationship with you? And everywhere you go, there you are. I mean, you can't sleep without you, you can't eat without you, you can't go to the bathroom without you, and if you don't like you, what a miserable day. <laughs> but let's just start with having peace with God. I'll just say a little bit about this. Obviously, if you're going to have peace with God, you need to repent of your sins, turn away from them, want a relationship with God. But let's just say that you are a Christian and Maybe you're one of those foolish Christians that's gotten a little bit mad at God because you're disappointed with the way your life's turned out. Oh, you would probably never say you were mad at God, but truth is, many people are just a little bit sour in their attitude toward God. They feel that God owes them something. And after all, I prayed and I believed and I went to church and I gave, and now look. Well, it's possible that maybe you were telling God what you wanted and you failed to find out what God wanted. A lot of times we're giving God our plan and we're mad at Him because He's not making it work. We don't plan and then pray for God to make it to work. 
we pray and find out what God's plan is. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said something that is very valuable, I believe. He said, I'm determined to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Paul was a very intelligent, highly educated man. And I think somewhere in his walk with God, he just got tired of trying to figure stuff out. And he said, I don't have to know why this happened, why that happened, why one disciple had this happen, another one had something else happen, why one suffers, another one don't. I don't have to try to figure all that out. All I need to know is Christ. I know God. I know his character. I know he's good. I know he loves me. I know I can trust him. I don't have to figure out the why behind everything. All I need to do is trust God. The Bible says we know in part. We're never going to understand God, and if we ever could, then He could no longer be our God. One of the reasons why we look up to Him is because there's a mysterious part to God that's so much greater than what our mind can ever get hold of. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 and 10 gives us some insight into the dangers of having a little rift with God. And I know you look very innocent tonight, but I can promise you there are people in this room that walked in tonight mad at God. Maybe you haven't put it in those words yet, but there's a little sourness in your spirit because it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. I had a, I had a woman tell me just recently that she was mad at God for many years because when she was 50 years old, she was still single. And the one thing that she had prayed for and begged God for was a husband. She couldn't understand it. She'd tried to be a good Christian. She'd believed God. She'd gone to church. She'd tried to be a blessing to people. And this one thing that she wanted <laughs> had not happened in her life. Until finally, she gave it up and told God, I can be happy with a husband or without a husband. I don't have to have that to love you and to be happy and then he gave her one. <laughs> well, then they were only married about 10 years, and she had a wonderful husband, and he went to the hospital to have a routine surgery, got a staph infection, and died. Who can understand that? We cannot understand that. She had to make a choice to appreciate the 10 years she had with him rather than get bitter because something went wrong that she couldn't grasp or understand. Don't be mad at God. He's the only person that can help you. When we get disappointed with God, are mad about the way things are going in our life, the first thing we start to do is crab and complain, which is very dangerous. It's back to that if you want to enjoy life and see good days, good whether a parent or not, keep your tongue free from evil. That includes murmuring, grumbling, and complaining. Now, I'm sure none of you ever complain. You just look to me like you just never complain about anything. 1 Corinthians 10, 9. We should not tempt the Lord and try His patience and become a trial to Him. You think you got trials? I'm sure God looks at us sometimes and thinks, I've got trials. <laughs> Putting up with a few billion grouchy, murmuring, complaining kids who no matter what I do, they're never happy. Do not exploit his goodness as some of them did and were killed by poisonous serpents. Now you got to see how important it is. Nor should we discontentedly complain as some of them did and were put out of the way entirely by the destroyer. Now there's another scripture here that says these things are written down for our instruction. The Israelites and their little journey through the wilderness, which was an 11 day journey but took them 40 years and most of them never made it. And it wasn't the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all the enemies that they thought God needed to get rid of for them. It was their attitude that kept them out there 40 years trying to make an 11-day trip. And part of the wrong attitude they had was an attitude of murmuring, grumbling, and complaining every time God didn't give them what they wanted. They were babies. Whining, murmuring, babies. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, I led you, I led you all the way 
these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to test you, to see if you would keep my commandments or not. It's easy to keep the commandments of God when everything's going our way. It's easy to praise God when everything's going our way. But what about when nothing's going your way and nothing has been going your way for a long time? That's when our relationship with God is tested. That's when our character is tested. I gave up trying to figure stuff out a long time ago. I've just basically said, I know God loves me. I know I've got a call on my life and I am gonna do it until I draw my last breath. If it's easy, I'm gonna do it. If it's hard, I'm gonna do it. But as long as I've got breath in me and I can move, I'm gonna do what God has called me to do. But one of the best ways to increase your own spiritual maturity is to find ways that you can agree rather than argue. I think it shows great maturity when we do what is necessary to live in peace. Deuteronomy 32, 30 says, one puts a thousand to flight and two, 10,000. The power of agreement is so amazing. And there's not nearly enough people that are willing to pay the price to live in agreement. 